Usually it is autoimmune, right? They're born with a genetic predisposition. <laughs> and then you see him at three years. Isn't it amazing? So the thing to appreciate with type 1 is it turns your world upside down. Everything you not ever thought about or don't have to think about, like we talked about the other day, when you eat, when you get up, when you go to bed, when you take, when you drive, uh, so many things you now have to think. So everything that was just automatic comes up to the conscious level and you have to think about it until you develop a new way of, of living. So I have great respect for people who have children that develop type 1. It is just overwhelming. It just turns the world upside down in, in overnight. Uh, the thing is now is we can take really good care of them, but it is still a lot of work. A lot of things that have to be learned and done uh, that the body can no longer do. So you are sitting there and your pancreas is adjusting minute by minute what it does uh, as you munch or drink or, or fast. Your body is taking care of every bit of it for you. Now you have to do that consciously. So it's a lot of long work, long work. Okay, so remember we talked about the release of insulin. Just to go back, we talked about 
Normally, you've got glucose being put out all the time, and when you eat, there's variations in your blood sugar based on the amount of usually carbohydrates, some extent to the protein that you've eaten. And your body, your, your pancreas produces insulin to mirror every bit of it. Okay. So now we have lost all of that. All right, so on the top of page two, definition of type one, chronic autoimmune disease in which destruction or damage to the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans results in absolute insulin deficiency. So type two is a relative insulin deficiency. They, they may make tons of insulin, but it doesn't control the blood sugar. Here, it's an absolute loss. There's, there's none made after a period of time. This failure is due to immune-mediated destruction of beta pancreatic beta cells. Type 1 and type 2 have in common high blood glucose. We talked about that. They cause serious complications. Now, the complications with type 1 and type 2 vary somewhat to the, uh, to the kind of the distribution. Type 1s don't tend to get the heart disease that type 2s do. Now, if they get overweight and they smoke and they do the things that bring on heart disease, they get it just like everybody. Uh, but they tend to not, their risk of cardiovascular disease is not too far off of what the general population. But they tend to get the kidney complications to a greater extent than, than other than type 2s. The prevalence for type 1 in the United States is, from 0 to 19, is 1.7 per 1,000. So one or two people per 1,000 folks. Whereas with type 2, we talked about it's about 10. So, big difference. Dr. Latassi? Yeah. I think the PowerPoint you're using is for the pharmacy stuff. Oh, did I pull the wrong one? <laughs> uh, I bet I did. Okay, let me... Thank you. <laughs> I did treat Thanks. So this is similar to what we saw with the type 2. There is a long period of time over which this disease uh, evolves. So we talked about you're born with how many beta cells? A million. Okay. You have to lose 80% of those before you start to become symptomatic. So you can see genetic predisposition at birth and somewhere in that, usually the first 20 years, most kids are diagnosed in the 10 to 14 year age. But you can have kids diagnosed as young as after six months, um, anywhere up to any age. So over time, when there has to be some immune insult, something that sets off an immune response, and then it over a period of months and usually years, you have decreasing beta cell function or destruction until they become symptomatic. Okay. So normal insulin release for years, progressive impairment, they get overt diabetes, they'll get symptomatic, they'll hopefully seek care. Uh, that honeymoon period is a brief uh, months, few months, maybe up to as long as 18 months where there's, there's some recovery of insulin activity and then eventually there's total destruction. The, the destruction of beta cells will march on until they're all gone. Okay, 
so there's no recovery, there's no remission. Uh, it will go to, at least at this point, with what we can do, um, it just it goes until it's, it's all done. Okay, let's walk through some of these different slides. What this one is showing you is beta cell mass on the y-axis time on x, and it's giving that same, uh, same uh, graph we just saw, genetic susceptibility, environmental trigger, antibodies develop, if you were measuring them then, you would find them, and then clinical onset when you hit a, a critical mass of that 20, about 20%. It is probably not a straight line nosedive. It is probably remitting. Uh, depends on how aggressive the immune system is, where you have uh, times where you get stable function and then another attack, stable function, another attack until you hit that critical mass. Over time, you constantly, or you're seeing a ramp up in T cells, B cells that are producing uh, the antibodies that are going to attack the, the beta cells. It's thought that there's different types of, of patterns, and that's what is up in this, up here, is that you may have some that rapidly progress, some that are relapsing, remitting. It doesn't matter. In the end, it all comes to the same thing. The reason they know this is that, oh, probably 15 years ago, they, uh, they really felt like they could, if they could identify uh, people who were at high risk for type 1s, then they could do several interventions that would prevent them from destroying their beta cells. So they identified siblings of usually children that had developed type 1. They put them on immunosuppressants to suppress the immune response. Uh, they put them on insulin because that tends to arrest uh, the immune response. And what they found over time is that it didn't matter. The immune suppression was worse than the disease, the things that happened to the kids. Uh, the insulin, the, you had to keep taking the insulin or else you would, your immune system would, would rev back up again. So in the end, they, they have not found anything that has really, that will terminate type 1. They're still, they work, there has been a vaccine in the work, uh, works, which may eventually come out. About the best thing that has happened is uh, islet cell transplant. Uh, but that still is the immune system will still attack and destroy. So they still have to take immunosuppressants, but a lot of them can go off insulin. Uh, and that can last varying lengths of time, uh, years uh, or months. Uh, so at this point, there's nothing we can do to stop the, the process. So this shows you, this is just another graph showing very uh, similar. So born with 100% beta cell mass, genetic predisposition, a viral trigger. So we believe that viruses, it ha you have to come across an environmental trigger. So you can be born with this susceptibility, but if nothing sets it off, then you, you go on with normal life. So there's people walking around that are at risk, but they don't come in contact with the trigger nothing happens. So the viral triggers seem to be the most problematic. Type 1 diabetes seems to pattern or follow very closely fall and spring viral illnesses. So you see uh, viral illnesses go up and then a few months later you'll see the instance of type 1 go up or diagnosis go up. It's thought that milk allergy, uh, cow's milk, has been implicated. Um, it's one of the reasons why we recommend that you not give cow's milk until after they're a year old, so that their gut uh, is fully formed, fully uh, functional, and can prevent the absorption from uh, abnormal or uh, proteins that the body will perceive as not cell. Okay. So those are probably the two big, um, two big ones. Um, Wheat-based diets have had some implication of vitamin D deficiency. But the viral infection, Coxsackie, we know does it. 
uh, rotavirus we know and rubella. Those are the three that we know that will precipitate uh, an event. So then what you see is an insulitis. So you see an inflammation of those beta cells. And you see those circulating antibodies. And these are the ones we test. So the uh, islet cell antibodies, Islet cell antibodies and GAD65. GAD65, very common, it's one of the ones I told you we draw. Uh, in, in adults, uh, sometimes you don't see these antibodies as, as well, but in kids, you, you tend to, these be, are common. Uh, circulating antibodies against insulin itself, and then also those, um, the other one, whatever, the zinc transporter. So these are not disease markers, they're, they're proteins that are being released because of cell destruction. And then the body has produced antibodies against them. So beta cell continues. This is months, could be years. Um, then a glucose intolerance would develop. They might have symptoms. They might be mild enough that no one notices. And then again, at that about 20% of beta cells left, that is when symptoms will show up. That's when they show up in your ER, your pediatrics, or your urgent care. The next cell slide is very busy, but I just loved it. So nothing to, for you to memorize, but just to look at the complexity of the immune system and what it does and how it systematically destroys a one cell type. It's amazing. Uh, I, I, I find it amazing. So again, it's, it's looking at being born with a normal beta mass, some type of trigger, and then you have um, just this proliferation of different cells that then um, will destroy the beta cell. So just another look. I also liked their explanation. I thought it was very interesting to, to read through. Again, not going to hold you to it. I've showed you three now uh, scenarios or, or pictures of what happens. Um, so you know it's, it's a long period of time. In kids, it, it, they tend to get sick fast once they hit that critical mark. Adults, as they get above 20 or 25, it starts to slow down. So adults, we often miss a type one. One is because we don't really suspect it, but type ones, the immune destruction is very slow. So it's called LADA, latent autoimmune disease of adults. So it can take years uh, for that to, uh, to occur. Often, here's the way they'll present. They'll present and they'll be really sick. Um, their blood sugars are terrible. They're an older person. Nobody's thinking type one. They'll put them in the hospital, stabilize them, send them out. Sometimes they'll recover enough insulin function that they can even go with uh, oral agents for a few years. What I usually find is those people have to go to insulin pretty quickly. Sometimes within a year or two, they've got to have insulin added on. Then what I found is usually at about five to eight years, most of those people are on insulin totally. They have, um, so it's a much longer period of time. That's why I'm telling you, always treat the symptoms the patient is presenting and telling you about. Okay? If the patient is telling you through its symptoms and their weight loss that they're not producing insulin, then give them insulin until they don't need it anymore. Don't worry about if they're type 1 or type 2. Now you can pretty much figure it out. We can do those autoantibodies. That's why they drew him on Dr. Veneta. He came in extremely atypical. He is a subvariant. I'm telling you, he's, he's really unusual. But people are going to be looking at him going, well, you're 45, 50 years old, and I don't know why you would have type 1. Uh, so, but I think he went on insulin pretty early, if I remember right. But treat the symptoms the patient's presenting with, not the what you put them in. Not you go, oh, you've got to be type 2. Well, not really. Okay. All right, questions? Yes? So we vaccinate for rubella at the MMR, correct? But since the anti-vaccine movement has started, has there been an increase in 
I don't know. I, I thought about that when I was going through it, but I didn't. I didn't go back and look to see. I didn't. Didn't take the time. But it would be interesting to see. Not that I know of. But I also don't know that vaccines have changed. We don't vaccinate against Coxsackie, right? And it's probably one of the biggest ones. Uh, so I don't know that vaccinations have decreased the incidence of type one either. That would be something else. Okay. okay. So let's look at clinical presentation. Okay, at this point, clinical presentation will make a lot of sense to you because we've gone over the physiology of the pancreas. We've talked about what happens when insulin is present. We've talked about what happens when insulin isn't present. Now when a type 1 presents to you, they are the most, they are the furthest on the continuum. So this is an extreme of, of severe uh, insulin deficiency. Um, so common ones we're going to go through these, we'll walk through the pathophys again and what you would see, what you would order. But the treatment of this, you're going to do an ER. You're going to do DKA uh, then. And another one is called hyperosmolar coma. So hyperosmolar coma and DKA are very severe acute uh, complications of diabetes. Hyperosmolar coma usually occurs in uh, type twos, and DKA usually in type ones. The difference is ketones. You get ketogenesis in DKA, you don't get ketogenesis in hyperosmolar coma or hyperosmolar syndrome. Okay, so in, this is more uh, severe insulin deficiency, things that they would present with. Uh, the central actions, polydipsia, polyphagia, polyuria, weight loss, all of those are going to be uh, present. They are, may or may not have changes in mental status. Usually the worse the acidosis, the more likely they will have more CNS depression. Uh, usually they'll come in with some type, usually it's a GI virus, most commonly. So they, they've had 24 hours of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, very common. More so in, in adults, kids may not have that severe of, of um, symptoms. Uh, urinary, they're going to be very uh, complaining of having to go to the bathroom a lot unless they've got so dehydrated that they're not producing a lot of urine that can happen. They're going to have glucose in their urine. Their respirations are going to be increased because they are producing lots of acid. Their keto, their keto acids are being converted into hydrogen ion, CO2, water. Uh, ketones, if they're producing acetone, then they are going to smell like it. Uh, and blurred vision can also be another uh, complaint. And they'll be dehydrated. Remember, I told you the average in an adult, if it's severe and it's gone on a day or two, it'll be five to six liters of fluid. So what will that look like? How will you know they're dehydrated? Pardon? Capillary refill. Skin tinting. What else? Dry mucous membranes. That's the big thing. Okay, they're thirsty. Their blood pressure is going to be very low. What did you say? That took weight loss. Weight loss. They may or may not be able to tell you that. So, uh, but yes, if you could weigh them before and after, if you weigh them and go, well, okay, here's your weight. Well, I usually weigh such and such. So, depends on how long it has gone on is, is the weight loss. So, age of occurrence, again, type 1, any age, usually in kids. Usually before the age of 20, but not always. Not always. Uh, we talked about onset is, is uh, abrupt. So you've got the absence of insulin, so counter-regulatory hormones reign. They are very active. The person is fairly stressed. So you've got adrenaline putting, or you've got um, norepinephrine or epinephrine coming out of the adrenals. You've got glucagon coming out of the pancreas. Cortisol coming out of um, the adrenal uh, cortex. 
So you've got lip, you've got fat breakdown, muscle breakdown, and liver is is churning out glucose as much as it can. So the, the big problem comes out of that fat breakdown. You're releasing free fatty acids and glycerol. So that's going to go back to the liver, and the liver's going to do what the glycerol? It's going to make glucose out of it. What's it going to do with the free fatty acids? It's going to make ketones. It's going to beta oxidation, and those mitochondria are going to produce ketones. Because ketones is a secondary source of fuel, the brain can use it. The muscles are going to break down because they, they can't absorb uh, amino acids very much at all anymore. <coughs> and they're going to go through their, their glycogen stores and they're going to start releasing lactate and all types of amino acids. So what happens to those? Lactate gets taken back up and by the liver and converts it to glucose, goes into the slow cycles and then the, uh, the amino acids are taken up by the liver and converted into glucose. So you can see why when they present, their blood sugars are usually in the five to six hundred range. But they could be lower. Depends if they come in early. Making sense so far? Okay. Bottom of page six. So hyperglycemia. In a type one, it's it's almost always going to be above two hundred, probably above two fifty. It could be as low as 300, especially if it's gone on chronically, but more typically it'll be higher than that, 500, 600. Okay. So we've talked about, think through all the places where it's coming from. Remember the body is all about fuel. You've lost the main messenger. You've lost the main director of fuel use and fuel deposition. So because you have unrestrained catabolic activity, you tear down. You tear down muscle, you tear down fat, and you tear down glycogen stores uh, in the liver. And the kidney is also picking in glucose, making new glucose and adding that. And the person probably for a while is still eating. Okay, so all of that is adding to. The ketones. Okay, so this is what gives us the diabetic ketoacidosis and the metabolic acidosis. And it is all of that, tri that fatty acids coming from the fat cells for the most part, taken up by the liver, converted into ketones. The three ketone bodies are what? Acetone, acetoacetic acid, and hydroxyurine. The true ketone out of all of those is acetoacetic acid. Beta-hydroxybutyrate is a form of that, and then acetone is a ketoacid. No, it's a, it's a true ketone. Ketoacid is the acetoacetic acid. That, that stuff doesn't matter. Okay, so as those ketones start to accumulate, what's your first buffering system in the body? Yes, bicarb. In the blood, right? So bicarb. So what you're doing is you're pouring huge amounts of acid are being absorbed into the bloodstream. and it does very, very gentle, or not gentle, but minute to minute uh, changes in your adjustments all the time. But it is easily overwhelmed. So then, 
this goes up, CO2, right? So how do we get rid of that? Breathing. So it stimulates medullary centers, right? So then what happens? We hyperventilate. So now you know why they're why they're breathing faster. Because they're trying to, they can correct that acidosis if they can get rid of enough CO2. Okay. But you can't. You can't breathe enough to get rid of it. Okay. So they have a typical pattern of respiration, respiratory abnormality <coughs> called Kussmaul. It's very deep and rapid. If you ever see it, you want, you'll, you'll know it. It's like, <sighs> and, they, and their breath smells like, rotted fruit. It's very musky. It's that acetone coming off. I don't always smell it in all uh, high two, or in DKA, but if, if you ever smell it, you'll, you'll know it. Okay? So that's where, that is your second. So bicarb is your first defense. Kid, uh, your pulmonary is your second defense. Your kidneys would be a third defense, but they take too long. We've got them recovered by the time the kidneys can, can change your bicarb uh, amount. Okay. Keep in mind the relationship between alveolar ventilation and CO2. Okay. So is, is so what, what happens there? CO is what alveolar um, ventilation goes up or down with CO2, rising CO2 levels. Okay, so you've got that wonderful equation called Henderson-Hasselbach. I love this equation. Okay, so the pH of the blood is equal to 6.1. That's a, a static number. And the log of your bicarb, the base, over the acid. And that 0 0.3 is the dissolvability quotient of CO2 in the blood. That's where that comes from. So if you can remember this, it will help you remember about acid base. Because if acid goes up, what happens to pH? It goes down. They're inversely proportional, right? So, and as base, if the base accumulates, then the pH goes up. So it's, if you ever get into acid-base problems, then if you go back and think about this, it'll help you. So, the, so often when people present, the biggest thing you have to figure out is, is this a, a, a metabolic or a respiratory, correct? Mm -hmm. More than likely, what is their CO2 going to be, like, be when you see them? What's a normal CO2? It's about 35 to 45. What are they likely to come in at? They're likely to come in at about 20 to 25. Okay? They, because they're compensating, right? The acidosis is a metabolic. You are producing and throwing ketones into a system so, and the comp compensatory is a respiratory alkalosis. Remember that? Surely, you, surely uh, McNeil went over that, right? Yeah. Okay. So more than likely, that's what they'll look like. Their pH will be going down. Their bicarb. You can get serum bicarbs, but usually we use a CO2 content on the Chem 6 or Chem 7. You all seen that? Mm -hmm. It's an indirect measure of your bicarb. You familiar with it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So indirect measure of bicarb. So it's normally is 22 to 28. So it'll usually be around maybe 15, 10 to 15. So that's what you would see. pH is down, CO2 is down. Bicarb is down. If you know they're diabetic and you know they've been sick or they've stopped taking their insulin, common reason for uh, 
people to go into DKA is they stop taking their insulin. They run out or they stop. They get sick and they stop. They get sick and they don't eat and they think, okay, I'm not eating, I don't take my insulin. Okay, that's, that's not correct. But it makes logical sense, right? So one of the things we can do is measure ketones. We can measure it in the urine. We can measure it in the blood. Okay? If we measure it in the urine, we use a nitroprusside test. You get these beautiful purples. Uh, and they correlate to the amount of uh, ketone in the urine. Or you can order a serum hydroxybutyrate level. You're not going to do acetone. You won't find it. And acetoacetic acid, they don't measure. The biggest pool is that beta hydroxybutyrate. You would order that, a serum concentration. It'll take you a while to get it out. If they got, uh, if they could produce urine, then you could do a nitroprusside test. If that's positive, you may want to get a, get a, get a serum hydroxybutyrate. Did I put that on your lab medicine? That serum hydroxybutyrate? Okay, next page. Anion gap. You thought you were going to run away. minus your chloride and your anions, your cations minus your anions. So here their serum bicarb is going to be remarkably reduced. They're going to have been going through that. So usually if they have a anion gap, it's due to that. They've used up that bicarb. So they're, they will always have an elevated anion gap. So normal is 3 to 10. It's going to be above 10. So they will have an anion gap, metabolic acidosis. So it helps you to differentiate because other things cause normal gap, metabolic acidosis. That beta hydroxybutyrate, the one thing to remember about it is it forms a very large pool and it takes a long time to get rid of. So we can get their blood sugars down pretty fast within a few hours, but you'll, you'll see when you, get to e, when you get to the ER and you're talking about DKA, we will keep giving them insulin for quite a length of time to clear that pool. It'll take about 12 hours. So we'll get their blood sugars down within a few hours, and then for another six to eight hours, we'll keep them on the insulin. We'll give them some dextrose so their blood sugars don't get too low. And that will help to clear that beta hydroxybutyrate. If you only go by the blood sugar and turn the insulin off and convert them over to injectable, they will go, they'll decompensate. They'll go right back into a metabolic acidosis because you haven't cleared it out. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Polydipsia, uh, we talked about the other day that their plasma osmolality goes up uh, because the big determinants are sodium, glucose, and urea nitrogen. I forgot the 2.8, I think, the other day when I put it up on the board. So glucose makes is what's making their um, osmolality go up. This is where, now adults don't get into trouble so much, but this is where kids get into trouble is that osmolality causes big shifts in fluid, right? If you've got a more, uh, if you've got differences in solute concentrations, where does water go? It goes to the higher concentration of solute, right? So what happens is water will move out of the brain rapidly. 
and they will get a little crinkling in the brain. And they can die. That's why that coma becomes a problem in kids and where, how they get missed. When, uh, I assume in ER you talk about how the kids, we do a little bit differently. We go a little bit slower so that that shifts uh, in fluid and their osmolality we pay a little bit different attention to. We do the same in adults when they get hyperosmolar syndrome is we really slow down uh, because of those big shifts can cause brain damage, neurologic damage. Serosodium, next page. When patients come in in DKA, they always have a, uh, they're always hyponatremic. So the normal serum sodium is what? 135 to 145. You must know that's one of your objectives. One of those you just, you just need to know. So they'll usually come in and they'll be 130, 132. So, but I'm telling you it's false. It's a false lowering. So what happens is, um, and when you calculate, and their as osmolality is always going to ca be calculated off of the measure. But you can correct it just to make sure that it is, it's in range. So you get a lot of, you've got a volume that you're measuring sodium in, but there's things that are taking its place, so, or scooting it out. Triglycerides have gone up. Lots of sugar there, water's being drawn in early on, and so the sodium gets somewhat diluted. So we have a way to uh, correct it. So there's two different ways you can figure out which. So for every 100 blood sugar over 100, the, the true calculation is to add 1.6. Now a lot of people just, uh, for ease, add 2. 2 for every 100. So if you all want to do that, you can. It's easier to remember. You calculate in your head. So if their blood sugar, if they come in and their blood sugar is 550, 550 milligrams per deciliter, let's say their serum sodium is 130. Then we're going to take, I would just subtract the 100. Now I've got 4.5 one hundredths over 100, over normal, right? Now I'm going to multiply it by 2. What is that? 9. And I'm going to add it to the sodium. That's their corrected sodium, 139. Okay? Be able to do that. Know that that is a problem. When people are in metabolic acidosis, high blood sugar, their sodium is uh, falsely low. So the 130 is what? The measured sodium? 130 is the measured sodium. Usually, unless there's some other problem, they are, it, I, I don't think I've ever seen less than 130, maybe 129, but they don't come in in 120s. So you take their blood glucose number, we're, we're taking 100 off because that's normal, subtract it out, multiply this number times 2 and add it to their sodium. Yes? So what's the 100? I know you said it's normal, but normal for, what's the milli equivalent per liter? Blood, oh sorry, that's why I, it, sorry, 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 this is blood sugar. That's why I started to do that. Okay, normal blood sugar. Blood sugar. Where did you get the 4.5? How did it go from 450 to 50? Normal blood sugar, normal. So let's say their, blood, their sodium really is 139, but when we measure it, it's 130. Okay? So we know that high blood sugars called falsely low. So we're taking the 550 as their blood sugar, we're subtracting 100 out because that's already been accounted for, and we get a factor of 450. So we're looking at how many hundreds over normal do we have? We have 4.5. I'm going to multiply that by 2, 
add it to their measured sodium. Everybody got it? Be able to do that. Know that. Know that that's a problem. That would be good. Sarah potassium. Huge losses of potassium in a metabolic acid in this metabolic acidosis. Okay. This will be one of your decision points when you get your DKA and you talk about treatment. concentration gradient, it's got a lot of it, so it moves into the cell to stay neutral, the potassium moves out. Okay. So if you see these folks early, you may see hyperkalemia and, um, and a, a mild metabolic acidosis. As it, so what happens to all this potassium in the bloodstream? Well, the kidneys just get rid of it. You get it to the kidneys, it just tosses it out. Okay? So, it will just, as long as they can pee out and their renal function is working, they will get rid of that extra load of potassium. People lose somewhere between 600 and 900 milliequivalents of, of potassium in a DKA. So, if it comes in elevated, and above, it would be above what number to be called elevated? 5.1. So let's say they come in at 5.3, 5.4. And they're in acidosis, and you know it hadn't been that long, what are you going to think? How are you going to interpret it? Oh my gosh, I need to give KX late. We were going to go, that's because they're acidotic, right? So if I correct the underlying acidosis, and they probably haven't lost as much because they've still got pretty high levels, that will correct itself and will give them a little bit of potassium to replace. Okay, do you follow that interpretation? Okay, so let's say they come in and their uh, potassium is four. Then what are we gonna think? Is that normal? So we see a normal, is it liter? No, that's for liter. So we see a normal potassium and they've got an acidosis. Their pH is 7.2. Now how do we interpret that? They've lost a lot of potassium. Okay. So what happens, so here's the problem. Our big treatments of DKA or we're going to give them insulin or even give them fluids. First thing we do is we give them a lot of fluids. Give them at least a liter of, of saline. And then we start insulin. If we do that, what's going to happen to their potassium? It's going to go back in the cell. What will happen to their serum potassium? So in this instance, you'll see when you get to treatment, you will give, you'll go ahead and start your fluids, but you're going to give potassium along with it. Okay. Because what this represents is a significant loss, but we, as long as their kidneys are working, we can go ahead and give them fluids, we can give them insulin, and we can keep their potassium from falling a lot. What if they come in and their, their potassium is 3.3 and their pH is 7.1? What is 
their potassium level now, how would you characterize it? It's, it's below normal, it's hypokalemic, right? If I give them fluid and insulin, what's going to happen? Huge drop. This is a, a big, they have lost a significant amount of, of, of body potassium. Okay. So here what we would do differently is we would restore the potassium first and then we would give them fluids and, and IV insulin. Okay. See the difference? What, I don't expect you to know the treatment stuff. I'm trying to show you that here's the consequences. What I need you to know is the level of, of potassium in light of an acidosis you interpret differently. If it's elevated, then we're not going to do anything except treat. But as they get normal to hypokalemic, it's, it represents significant potassium loss. Okay. Um, and it will take you about 24 hours to restore it because it's hard to restore. Number one, PO, it makes them sick. IV, it's more limited in rate because it will burn their little veins. Okay. All right. Follow this. You've got this concept and you've got the, the effect of acidosis. That's where I want you to be uh, now. Okay. Other lab, phosphate will do the same thing. They'll lose a lot of phosphate. We just replace it. Usually we'll use it as a salt, like potassium phosphate. And we can hit two birds with one stone. Creatinine will almost usually be elevated because by the time they come in, they will be dehydrated. If they go 24 to 48 hours with that GI symptoms and they quit taking their insulin, they'll be in DKA. They can go in 24 hours if they are really sick and stop their insulin. Okay, so usually VUN and creatinine will be up. But what does that elevated VUN tell you? Remember we talked about is it pre-renal, renal, post-renal? Post so if it's really elevated, what's which? What's it telling you? Pre-renal, azotemia, they're fluid depleted. So that's usually goes along. Leukocytosis, they will often have an elevated leukocytosis. It won't be tremendous, but they'll have some due to stress. So epinephrine, cortisol will all raise there. So they may come in with a white blood cell count. What's normal? 4 to 11. 4 to 11. 4,000 to 11,000. So let's say they come in at 12 or 13. If they come in around 25, there's an infection. So if it's really marked, it's, there's an infection process. But if it's slightly elevated, it's mostly due to just the stress hormones. The glucoseuria and polyuria, we talked about renal thresholds, so keep that one in mind. Once we exceed that renal threshold, the, all the filtered sugar can no longer be reabsorbed, and so we start spilling it in the urine, so we can find it there. Polyphagia, we talked about you can't get the energy into the cells. Uh, and so the, they are going to talk about eating more and uh, losing weight. One of my professors in the pharmacy school was, um, was a type 1 diabetic, and he would always tell the story. He was in his early 20s, and he started losing weight, and he thought he had cancer. Um, so he went to the doctor, he's from West Texas, he's a funny guy, he went to West Texas, went to the doctor and he said, I, you know, I think I have cancer and the doctor said, well, I don't, I don't know about that, but you have diabetes. And he said, I had no idea what that was, but I jumped off the, the, um, the, the exam table and I hugged the doctor because I, I didn't know what diabetes was, but I didn't have cancer. <laughs> so, anyway. Uh, blurred vision we talked about. They may or may not complain of that. It may be so insidious they may not have realized it. Um, so again, it's the accumulation of that glucose in the lens of the eye. The lens is what lets you accommodate, lets you look up close, lets you look far away. Usually they'll complain of not being able to read with their glasses or things are blurry. Um, 
That is the symptom that takes the longest to get rid of. It will take about six to eight weeks to go to normal. It will keep improving. But the, again, the lens just can't get rid of it. It won't be able to metabolize the glucose. So it will just have to leach out. So it, it can take the longest. So in summary, DKA is characterized by hyperglycemia, anti-gap metabolic acidosis, and ketonemia. It, metabolic acidosis is often the major finding. Glucose is usually less than 800. I'd say it's usually more in the 4 to 500 range. Hyperosmolar coma, those people get into the 6, 900. The highest I've ever seen is 1200. Uh, but I have seen higher when they take the blood draw downstream from the dextrose infusion IV that's going on. I have seen those. Uh, but about 1,200 is the highest. Um, let's see. In certain settings, starvation, pregnancy, treatment with insulin prior to getting the emergency room, so they may have tried to treat themselves at home, or use of those SGLT2 inhibitors. Glucose may not be that elevated. Okay. All right. Got it? Makes sense? Okay, sorry. All right. Um, well, do you want to start? Um, insulin therapy, or do you want to go on to lunch? You want to start it? Okay. Management of type 1. Moving on to that handout. 